Hello and welcome once more to the Knights Templar Church. I'm Reverend Steve Chris Cole and today's sermon is taken from the book of John. Uh, again, it's uh, chapter 14 this time and we're going to look at the first seven verses. So that's verses one to seven. So let us just begin with a word of prayer. Holy Father, we pray Lord that you've, you're with us at this time. Lord, that we s study your word we give the, um, our thoughts and our understanding to understanding what it is, Lord, that you are trying to tell us through your word. So, Lord, we ask you that you will bless us through the Holy Spirit. In Jesus' precious name. Amen. Okay, so let's begin. I'm going to read the first seven verses of John chapter 14. And it reads as follows. Let not your heart be troubled, Ye believe in God, believe also in me. In my Father's house are many mansions. If it were not so, I, I would have told you. I go to pre uh, prepare a place for you. And if I go and prepare a place for you, I will come again and receive you unto myself, that where I am, there ye may also be also. And whither I go, ye know, and the way ye know. Thomas saith unto him, Lord, we know not whither thou goest, and how can we know the way? And Jesus saith unto him, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No man cometh unto the Father but by me. If ye had known me, ye should have known my Father also, and from henceforth ye know him, and have seen him. So saith God's word. So, let's just remember the situation that we're in here. Um, the Last Supper is is over. It's finished. Judas Iscariot has gone off and done his, his uh, done his evil deed. And well, he's what is he doing? He's betraying Jesus, isn't he, to the Sanhedrin? Um, Jesus has, uh, has washed the disciples' feet, um, and kind of that they're in the middle of a conversation, uh, you know, while they're still in the room. Now this conversation is quite long. And it stretches out, in, in the book of John, it stretches out all the way to the end of chapter 17. So it's quite a, quite a chunk of, of speech. And we only find this conversation in uh, the book of John. Now, what I find fascinating, and I, I don't know if you do, but I find it fascinating that, that John was able to uh, re recollect such a, a long conversation. And I just wonder how that was possible, you know. So, just for a moment, let's, let's think to ourselves that we're in maybe an important meeting, uh, uh, wherever you work. Maybe the president of your company has come along and he's making an important speech, you know, that goes on for more than 15 minutes. Now, years later, years go by, and for some unbeknown reason, you're required or you need to write it down. Everything that was said at that meeting... Do you think you could do it? I know, and before you answer, I know I couldn't do that. Certainly, you know, my memory being the way it is. But for some reason or somehow, John seems to be able to write at length. Um, it's almost as if every single word has been seared into his, into his memory. Now, the thing is, you can be sure that, well, all right, we don't know the exact date that John wrote this gospel, but it, it must have taken place at some time, some years later. Uh, so we don't, we don't know how long it was, but even if it was only a year or two, and we don't know, as I said, uh, he's going to struggle, surely. I, I know I would, and I know many people would, struggle to remember you know, what was said. And yet we have such a long discussion which we're going to look at in the future. So does that mean that John was relying on his memory? Well, again, this is just my own th thinking on this one, but I, I am inclined to think maybe not. I mean, if he's anything like me, and well, I'm not John, obviously, um, it may be, but, but I have to be organised uh, to be able to, to do things. I have to have things 
sorted so that I know um, what I'm going to do. I, I use time management to, to the best of my ability. It doesn't always work out, but this is what I have to do to organize myself to be able to do things. Well, did John in 2000 years ago, did he understand about time management? I, certainly not the way we do today, I don't think. But the, you know, I feel sure that he saw these, these words that Jesus was speaking as his, I guess, the last opportunity to have a sit down conversation with Jesus because they all knew, he certainly did, he knew that, that, that Jesus was going to his death that very night. Now, I, it's just my opinion. I personally think he probably wrote stuff down. You know, made made a few notes as soon as after, afterwards, and it's possible even that even that at that time he may have um, had the idea that he was going to write down this entire gospel. Again, we don't know. We will never know until we meet him in heaven, of course, and then we can ask him, can't we? But whatever we whatever we see, whatever happened, we can see the hand of God is on this apostle. So by now, it, it's fairly obvious to the disciples that, that this is their last um, get-together. Jesus knows, he must know how, you know how they're feeling, and he sets out to comfort them. You know, these mortal men, the, the disciples who struggle with the spiritual nature of what Jesus is saying to them. Now you, you remember back in chapter 13, he told them, that where he's going they cannot go until a later time that is you can imagine them asking each other then can't you where is it he's going or he told us he told us that he was going to his death does that mean that we're also going to die only at a later time clearly they were upset they'd learned to trust jesus and his words but it must have been really difficult to understand the actual substance of what he was saying and what he said. So, as we'll see a bit later in this sermon, they even got tired of Jesus and his parables. Uh, you know, they asked, they asked him to speak plainly and, and not in parables. And that's, well, we can see that if you look at chapter 16, verse 9. They needed to put this whole situation into a context that, like, well, fishermen and tax collectors could understand. So Jesus talks to them, I imagine softly and lovingly. He reminds them about just who he is. He says, ye believe in God, believe also in me. Know who I am and always remember who sent me and why. You know, gentle reminder, isn't it? It's in verse two, he says, in my father's house are many mansions. And if it were not so, I would have told you. I go to prepare a place for you. So he uses this metaphor of this huge mansion, um, a very large and palatial building, as a, as a picture of where he's going. So this house, this imaginary house, it's so big and expansive, there's room for everyone. But before they go there, he, meaning Jesus, he's got to prepare a place for them. So what does that mean? Well. I guess it's a bit like, you know, when you go on holiday, you go to the travel agent, don't you? And you get somebody to book the hotel for you and bo just book the package, whether it's a flight, hotels, blah, blah, blah. And you get somebody to do that for you, you know. They need to make it right with the management, don't they, of the wherever it is you're staying or what, whatever you're doing. So in other words, what Jesus is doing when he says he has to prepare a place is he's basically interceding between the disciples and the Father. I mean, if Jesus didn't do that, for example, well, the holiday, if it was a holiday, um, in this case, your ability to enter God's kingdom, that well, it's invalid. It's like getting on the plane, getting there, and back in many years ago, there used, there used to be this sort of um, a topical well, kind of joke where you, you, if you go to Spain for your holiday and you get off the plane and you find that the, the hotel hasn't been built yet, well, you don't want something like that happening when you get to heaven. You, you need to know that it's all, everything is in place for you. So Jesus is settling the disciples' hearts. He's calming them so that they can relax. 
because uh, they're obviously sort of quite tormented uh, emotionally, uh, get them to truly listen to him. I mean, after all, don't high emotions, don't they sort of get in the way of thinking? Maybe that's a, a, a bit of a clue to John's ability, you know, to, to recollect the details of this particular day. He was calm. He was the closest person to Jesus. And it's likely, but this is just a guess, uh, it's likely that, that he had a deeper understanding of, of the spiritual aspects of his beloved master. But anyway, true to form, there are still those people who are perplexed about this whole thing, namely Thomas. Verse 5, what does he say? Thomas saith unto him, Lord, we know not whither thou goest, and how can we know the way? Of course, yes, it had to be Thomas, didn't it? He is a man that, uh, well, he has a hard time seeing the, the, the nose on the end of his face, this guy. I mean, some people just seem to have a really hard time trying to accept things without hard facts. And this, Thomas was known for this. And you'll see that later on when Jesus is ascended. There's, there's a story there. Not ascended, sorry, when he's risen, uh, resurrected. So... Here it is again. Jesus has already said to the group, before Thomas opens his mouth, he says in verse 4, he says, And whither I go, ye know, he said. And the way ye know as well. Yeah? Okay, so, but clearly, Thomas wasn't, didn't seem to be in the know. You know, I think we've learned to trust Jesus. Well, I hope we have. Um, so when he says, you know where I'm going, and how to get there, then surely everyone in the room must have known. Thomas must have known. So why on earth did he say that he actually didn't know? Seems a bit bizarre, doesn't it? Well, I think the reason is something like this. I think it's um, denial. I mean, he knew where Jesus was going. He knew he was going to his death. But I think denial is something that we all do at some point point or other, in some ways or, or other, excuse me, he just refused to want to acknowledge that Jesus was leaving him. This is my, we'll call it a guesstimate, shall we, based on what he did. It's a, it was a futile gesture, um, to which Jesus, maybe there was a tad frustration there, I don't know, but he launched into a statement that many people in our world actually find offensive. Yeah. He wasn't trying to be offensive to, uh, to Thomas, of course, but we're talking about 2,000 years later and the, uh, the attitudes and, uh, and thinking and ideologies of certain individuals in this world would have us not like what Jesus is saying. It's up to them. What did he say that, was, that pe some people today find offensive? He said, well, we'll read the verse again. Let's see if you can figure it out yourself. Verse 6, he said, Jesus saith unto him, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No man cometh unto the Father but by me. Now, when you hear that, you think, well, you know, that's, that's a very big statement, isn't it? See, Jesus, he could have said something to Thomas in reply. He could have said, he, said, he could have said, like, come on, fella, don't be so daft. Of course you know where I'm going. No, but that wasn't his approach, was it? Instead, he made a statement that's become, well, world famous. See, this is one of uh, seven I am statements that, that Jesus made, or, or is recorded for us in, in the Gospel of John. Uh, he said, he, the other ones he said were, uh, in John 6, he said, I am the bread of life. Uh, in John 8, and 9, he said, I am the light of the world. In John 10, he said, I am the door. And also in John 10, he said, I am the good shepherd. John 11, he said, I am the resurrection of the life and the life. And this time, in 14, he says, I am the way and the truth and the life. So we have a repeat of the life there, don't we? Uh, the next one is in verse in chapter 15. We'll see that later. I am the true vine, he says. So, 
why on earth would I say that people might find this offensive? Well, people find just about anything offensive today in today's world. First, but the thing is, with this is a big statement that Jesus has made. He says, firstly, he said, I am the way. Well, he's not being ambiguous. He's not saying, well, I'm one way, or, you know, there might be a couple of other ways, but, you know, if you come through me, etc. No, he didn't say that. I am the way. The way, not our way. In English, if you say our way, that means that there are others. No, he says, the way. The only way. The only way to God is through him. Hmm. So what does that do? <laughs> well, it completely negates every other religion on the planet. Yes, it does. I could go through them all, couldn't I? But uh, the time is never, never with us. Ah, uh, you can't get to God by Muhammad, Dalai Lama. No, sorry, or any of the million or so Hindu gods, just to name a few. Only through Jesus. I mean, that's quite a statement then, isn't it? Hardly surprising that so many people of other religions have a very, well, they say they have a respectful view, but I, I, uh, in terms of, uh, well, some of them, who shall remain nameless for the moment, really don't have some very nice things to say. Uh, anyway, what is the next thing he says? Well, he says then that... that he is the truth. Hmm. Surely everybody's truth is different, isn't it? Well, he says he's the, basically he's the only truth, the truth, because it's following on. I am the way, and he also means the truth and the life. So basically, whatever that you know, whatever other people have to say about what they call the truth is not the truth because it's not if it doesn't follow what Christ has said and done. So anybody that's you know doesn't follow Christ by virtue of that their truth is not true. And what do we call something that's not true? Well we call it a lie, don't we? And Jesus told us that well Satan is the father of all lies. So yeah, I guess you know. I, I guess that uh, I'm, I, you know this upsets quite a few people, doesn't it? Who think that their their truth is the real truth, the only truth. Well, sorry, Mormons. Sorry, Seventh Day Adventists. Sorry, J.W. Sorry, Islam, uh, etc. I trust Jesus, and if he says he is the truth. Sir, I believe him. I hope you do. What about this last part, the bit that says, I am the life? What does he mean? Well, as I mentioned, he, he's, he said it in uh, the, the previous I am statement. What, what does he mean? Well, to some extent, he means the life is the life of a Christian, and it's a spiritual life. And it's a life that he, through his life, has demonstrated to us. I am the life. His life. And how he's lived it as a truly remarkable example for the rest of us. And that's, I think, what, what he means by saying, I am the life. Or it could mean, there is another poss possibility... when it comes to the kingdom of God, it could well be that he means he is the life giver, the giver of life. He was present at the creation of the world, part of the creation process. He was involved in the creation process, so he is that life. So, just to emphasize this point, he finishes off the sentence with, no man cometh unto the Father but by me. So anyway, there you are. That's the answer that was given, the answering salvo, if you like, if you wanted to think of it as a, a, a it's not a broadside that has been given to, to Thomas. 
it was it was kind of like letting him down gently. He didn't give him a hard time about it. Or did he? Well, we haven't finished yet. Thomas's seemingly dull-witted comment may well just have been, like I said, um, denial. His care so much for Jesus, he didn't want to let him go. It's not a, it's not an unnatural thing to feel, is it, for some people? So finally then, let's have a look at verse 7. And this is why I said that maybe there's a little bit of hesitancy in what I was saying about what did he give him a hard time or not. Because in verse 7, Jesus says this. He says, if ye had known me, you should have known my father also. And from henceforth, you know him and have seen him. He said, I'll just repeat the words, if ye had known me. And it is another way to say that. Are you ready? If you've been paying attention to my teachings and taken them to heart, Thomas. So there is a little bit of a dressing down going on here, I think. I, think. I, I don't think that was an innocent throwaway comment. It was definitely directed at Thomas. If you had known me, you would know the Father. He's inferring that Thomas doesn't really know him. Maybe he's just not been listening. Well, I think he gets a bit of a telling off. And quite rightly so. So the idea it was, of course, that what Jesus was saying is you should be, you know, you'd be acutely aware that once you've seen me, if you've been paying attention to everything that I've been doing, then you would be seeing, you would know that you were seeing the Father. But if you think it was just Thomas that was having some problems with Jesus leaving, you'd be mistaken because it wasn't. We're going to look at the next part of the conversation in the next uh, sermon that I'm going to do, part two on John. But uh, we'll just mention something now. You see, it was Philip also. He was uh, equally mm, challenged, shall we say, to put it mildly. Um, what, you know, Thomas sort of he, he demonstrates this seemingly total lack of awareness. That should be a lesson to us, shouldn't it? He had the benefit of Jesus being with him for three, being with Jesus for the last three or maybe three and a half years in the flesh. You know, there traveling with him, listening to him, listening to him teach, listen, watching him do miracles, bringing people back to life, and yet even now, on the eve of his crucifixion, his death, he still didn't appreciate who Jesus truly was, and Philip similarly. So my question, if, if I may pay a, you know, sort of point a question at you and ask you, do, do you have any doubts that he is, is God? Do you struggle to see beyond the flesh and bones uh, uh, of, the, of the man Jesus in this story? When you, when you read the word of God, does it reach into you? Does it and, and help you to know God that little bit more each time? Hmm. Well, I'll leave you to answer that for yourself, because only you will know. Now, we're going to talk more on this subject in part two of this chapter. We're going to see how Jesus has got to reach past the seemingly dull understanding of these men and to, to, to truly enlighten them, but that's for next time. For now, I want you to just try and meditate on the person of Jesus, not just the, his physical nature and the story, but on the true spiritual nature of him as God. See his role in the scheme of things. See how he's conducted himself and, and then, then compare that to the char character of God, the Father. Not sure? Well, of course, there's much to learn, isn't there? The only way to gain a sound understanding of God is through studying the words he's given us. The words contained in the Bible. All of it. God wants us to know him. He wants us to trust him. How can we trust God if we don't know anything about his character? See, Jesus, he epitomizes, no, sorry, no, he personifies, that's a better way of putting it, he personifies the character of God. Because he is God. 
in human form. That's why I said personify. Now, watch out for uh, part two of John 14. Until then, God bless you. Thanks for watching. And may you have a blessed week. God bless. Bye-bye for now. Thank you.